uh, <clears throat> I appreciate and I'm honored again for the opportunity to be with us uh, today uh, to continue to learn and to share together even as we seek to build marriage according to God's pattern. Uh, that's one thing I'm very passionate about. Uh, you know, whenever I speak about marriage, uh, I am passionate about uh, the uh, living marriage as God intended and, uh, you know, pursuing God's pattern uh, for the marriage union. And so it's my prayer that as we do that, uh, God is going to help us align ourselves. You see, the word of God and the teaching of God's word uh, is meant to be like a mirror where we come and look. You see, the Bible says, uh, James chapter 1 and verse 22, be doers of the word and not uh, hearers only. Uh, then it says, uh, uh, for uh, somebody who looks at the mirror uh, and walks away and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was, uh, is the kind of person who hears the word and does not go and do it. So that tells you that the mirror is, uh, the purpose of a mirror is usually to adjust. Uh, you ladies are more uh, aware of this. You want to go to the mirror to make sure that uh, you, uh, you, know, you look okay, uh, anything that is off, you take care of it before you step out. And so, uh, you know, so because of that, uh, the mirror is a tool that helps you to adjust yourself. It shows you uh, stuff that makes you to align yourself to what you should be. And so that's the mirror of God's word. The mirror of God's word uh, gives us the picture of Christ likeness. Whenever we, the word of God speaks to us, it shows us the image of the son, the image of Christ. Uh, so that we can adjust ourselves accordingly, so that where we are far from that image, we go and do what the word of God teaches so that we can align to the image and the likeness of Christ. So that's the purpose of the mirror. And so even as we study on marriage, it's a mirror. Uh, what God's expectations are, what uh, God designed marriage to be, how God intended us to live with one another so that now we can go and adjust our lives accordingly so that we can be able to become the image uh, that God has painted or picked, I mean, drawn for us through his word. And when we get to that uh, image, that template, then we can be able to enjoy marriage as God intended. The secret to enjoying marriage is to listen to the author of marriage, uh, the one who instituted marriage. He is the one with the manual. He is the one with the, uh, you know, the design of how marriage was intended to work. And yesterday, I just went through that uh, fairly fast, looking at, uh, you know, the design for marriage, the purpose for marriage, and then we began to look at why. Sometimes we don't get ourselves to that design and purpose, and that is because of conflict. And so I highlighted a number of things that uh, bring about conflict, and that's what I want us to uh, address as we continue on. Uh, some of these things that cause us to uh, have conflict uh, in a marriage situation. All right. Um, so today I said we will talk about finances uh, because uh, when you look at statistics, the number one cause for divorce in um, marriage is money. It's about finance. Uh, the lack of it or the much of it, uh, you know, so that's the number one cause for divorce. So that tells you money is quite something. And if we don't address it and look at it, uh, you know, from a scriptural perspective, uh, it will help us to understand why money is the problem. And then it will also help us to know how then should we position ourselves to handle money right so that it doesn't compromise what God intended in our marriage relationships. And so uh, to begin with, uh, the Bible says in, uh, I mean, uh, let me point out some things about money 
first. And then now we can be able to, uh, you know, get into why it affects marriage. Uh, have you ever wondered why Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 uh, elevated money uh, to become to the place of being the greatest competitor of God or the place of God in your life? That's what Jesus did. Matthew 6, uh, 24, Jesus says, no one can serve. Let me just uh, open the scriptures uh, so that we can just look at it for a moment. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew uh, 6 and verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Then he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon speaks about uh, <clears throat> the spirit behind money. So you cannot serve God or mammon. And so that tells you something. Uh, in that particular passage, Jesus could have said, you cannot serve God or the, and the devil at the same time. But he said mammon, speaking of the power of money. Uh, so that tells you, you know, money is so powerful that Jesus equated it to be the greatest competitor of the place of God in your life. In other words, if you serve money, then money dislodges the lordship of Christ in your life. Because you can't serve two masters. So money is a master uh, when you serve money. Uh, or God is a master. So if God is the master, money becomes a servant. If money is a master, then it means that God will not be who he is meant to be in your life. So you can't serve God and money. That tells you something powerful, uh, I mean, about money. Uh, we can't underestimate the power of money and the place of money and why money has become uh, one of the biggest reasons for couples to have conflict in their relationship. Um, so money in and of itself is neutral. Uh, you know, forget now about the mammon spirit. We are talking about now the hard cash. Money in and of itself is neutral but money takes on the personality of the owner. That's why the devil exploits money uh, to influence uh, a person. He exploits your weakness, sorry, to influence, uh, you know, and to take control of you through money. Because money takes on the personality of the owner. Money in the hands of a good person will serve a good cause. Money in the hands of an evil person will serve an evil cause. So uh, money is neutral, but it takes on the personality of the owner, the one who possesses it at that time. Now, that tells me then money is the greatest revealer of character. You know, uh, you want to know the character of a person, see how they behave around money see how they behave and uh, you know when there is a lot of money in their hands or at their disposal a lot of resource because when you talk about money money is a resource it represents a resource you know with money you can buy anything you want with money you can do business you know so it's a resource so see how somebody behaves uh, where there are resources that reveals to you the true nature of that person. Or see how that person behaves when the resources are withdrawn and taken away from them. You know, uh, they had it and then now all of a sudden they don't have it. What are they capable of doing uh, because of pursuing after it? Uh, that's why they say everybody has a price, uh, you know, they are talking about the power of money because there is some there is a place or there are buttons that can be touched and somebody can 
cross a threshold in terms of either compromising, compromising their values or principles in order to get it. And the question is, uh, do you have a price? You know, do you go for the highest bidder? Uh, the highest bidder may not be an individual. The enemy could be, uh, you know, the one bidding for your life. Do you go for the highest bidder? So money reveals character. It's a revealer of character. Now, in marriage, when people come into a marriage, everybody has a, what I would call uh, a worldview concerning money. Everybody has, uh, you know, a certain perspective uh, about money. Everybody comes into a marriage situation with certain value system concerning money, and that impacts on the relationship that person gets into, uh, any kind of relationship. And if that relationship is a marriage, uh, being the closest or most intimate of all kinds of relationship, it will definitely be impacted. Because when you get married, money is going to be a factor because you need money to put a roof over your head. You need money to eat. You need money to clothe. You need money to move around. You need money to fulfill your... Uh, many aspirations and dreams, you know, you need money to take children to school, you know, so money cannot be ignored. But then the value system you have, the perspective, perception you have concerning money will impact on your relationship with your spouse. And so that's what uh, ideally couples should audit um, even before they get into a marriage relationship and you know interrogate this kind of conversation and uh, the conversation about what is their values about money how do they look at money uh, you know but then a lot of couples we don't do that so we got married we discover this in the marriage union and uh, trying to resolve it so late in the game so to say you find that a lot of conflicts can, uh, you know, it becomes sometimes too late to handle the conflicts that are produced as a result of one's value system concerning money. So um, there are three basic attitudes people have of money when they get into marriage. You know, everybody has, a, a, a value system of money. Uh, there are people who are generous, there are people who are stingy, there are people who are economical, there are people who are spendthrift. You know, these are different, uh, you know, uh, you know, value system that informs one how one handles money. You know, there is somebody who, when they have money in the bank, it itches, uh, you know, and they have to spend it. You know, but there are people who enjoy just having money in the bank. They don't want to touch it, you know. Uh, so we, we have different personalities when it comes to how we handle money. But then there are three basic attitudes that people have when they get into a marriage union. And every marriage falls into one of these three attitudes. Every person, not, not uh, so to say, every person in a marriage falls in uh, or has one of these three attitudes that we normally come into a marriage relationship with. The first group is the attitude when I enter into a marriage union and the attitude I have is uh, my money, your money. So what is mine is mine. What is yours is yours. You know, that's the first attitude. Uh, their perception is money is, you know, we can talk everything else, but money is my personal space, my personal thing. Uh, that's, that's, I can't let go. It's me. Uh, I'm the one who determines what I do with my money. I'm the one who determines what, uh, you know, I budget for, you know, with my money, it's my money. It's it's my money. I'm possessive about that which is mine. It's mine. 
So there's, there's that attitude. And then now yours is yours, you know? Uh, so we get into marriage with that attitude. The question now we need to ask ourselves, what are the pros and cons of such an attitude in a marriage relationship? Now, that attitude, by the way, informs some things. Uh, you've had, I, I know you're familiar of things like the prenups uh, agreement where people uh, put pen into paper that whatever I came in with into this marriage is mine. It doesn't, you know, and, and so in case of things going south, then uh, these are not going to be in play when it comes to uh, sharing uh, of uh, the property, uh, in, in matrimonial property, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, whatever agreement about uh, concerning the personal resources that one carries or comes with into a marriage union, you know, so uh, in such relationships, what you find is people now come to the table and agree. You will pay the rent. I will buy the food. You will pay the school fees. I will do this, you know, because, uh, you know, and then once we do that, if, if I'm paying rent and that's what I'm required to do in this relationship, once I pay rent, I will not bother where food is coming from because that's your role. You know, you are supposed to bring the food. Uh, I will not bother about the school fees because I'm the one who is taking care of uh, whatever else that we have a good day of. And so if the children don't go to school, uh, then, you know, you figure out how you get the money. Uh, and even if, if I was to give you, I'm lending you, you have to pay back. So that's my money, your money. So everybody has their money. They are, they are the only place, the common ground is the shared responsibility where they say, you are going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then once I play my role in terms of the responsibility we have assigned to me, then you have no business asking me about what I do with the rest of my money. Now, does that support God's design for marriage? Let's look at scripture again. The Bible says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, let me submit to us that the goal of marriage, when you read that scripture, you, you see a progression. And the progression is towards oneness. The goal of marriage is oneness. The goal of marriage is intimacy spirit, soul, and body. That's the goal of marriage, intimacy, oneness. Now, when I, my money is mine, I do what I want with my money, you do what you want with your money, we will be pulling apart instead of pulling together. Eventually, cracks begin to show in the marriage uh, because we are pulling apart, we are not pulling together. You know, uh, you are doing your thing and I'm doing my thing. Money gives you options. That's why you find if my money, your money is the attitude in a marriage relationship, a husband will have plots, will have property that the wife has no idea she has. I mean, he has. A wife will have investments that the husband has no idea she has, you know? And uh, that also means that, you know, when it comes to the flip side, I can finance an, uh, you know, clandestine relationship because it takes money to finance such. Uh, and my wife will have no idea that I have something like that, just like she has no idea I have property, just like he has no idea she has investment. So it's very easy for, uh, one to live a double life, you know, uh, when we have my money, your money kind of attitude. And then secondly, uh, my money, your money attitude uh, works on the premise that if things go wrong, then uh, I keep what is mine. So if things go wrong and south, I keep what is mine. 
The problem with that attitude is this, that I will never be fully committed to this relationship, although I'm there, because I have a plan B. Uh, if things go wrong, then my plan B kicks in. Now, the moment you bring a plan B into the marriage union, then that marriage is said to be dysfunctional, if not fail. Because you will not maximize, it will, you will not live to the full potential God intended for that union. You know, when we make vows, one of the, the traditional vows that are made, we normally say that, uh, you know, uh, with this ring I give you, uh, my body I give to you, you know, all that I am, I give to you, and all that I have, I share with you. You know, now that my money, your money kind of attitude doesn't promote that aspect. So there is what is yours and there is what is mine. Let's go on to the other three, then we can be able to look at them now, holistic and see uh, which one works and what is supposed to be the case in a marriage setting. The next one is your money, my money, our money. So the first one, my money, your money. The second one, my money, our money. Uh, so this one is where one party uh, feels that the other person should take responsibility and many times it used to be traditionally the women who would have that attitude. My money, our money. So the man's money is ours. But mine is mine for my personal to take care of myself, to groom myself, to you know, go to the salon and all that kind of stuff. So mine is mine, but yours is ours. So you pay the bills. After all, the man is the provider. So you pay the bills, you do the stuff. Uh, then mine, let me beautify myself uh, for you. You know, so my money, our money. Now, in the recent past, that attitude has shifted even to the men. So you find because the girl child got empowered and now women earn sometimes more than the man, you would find a situation where the person earning more money, theirs becomes our money and the person earning less uh, feel that theirs is less, so theirs becomes my money. So even men have that attitude today. So you find a man who is supposed to provide for his family now has deferred to the wife who seems to earn more and now is like expecting the wife to take the lion's share of the responsibility of financing uh, the home. Uh, you know, again, that's not the way uh, to promote oneness in a relationship. And this is how. Um, when we have my money, our money approach into a marriage relationship, uh, even when the person that is providing uh, the resource needed uh, is happy to do it, uh, time comes when that person begins to feel used and taken advantage of even when they were initially happy to do it. They are paying the bills, they are taking care. But then in the, the traditional world, women never used to work many years back. Now, that's why the man would bring the bacon home or the bread home, so to say. Um, you know, now, and the man would gladly do it because he knows the woman is earning nothing. Uh, at that time, she is the homemaker, she is taking care of the home. And so he would gladly do it, uh, go work himself out to bring food home. After all, he's supposed to do that. He's responsible to do that. But then we have, the world has shifted to a place where the woman is also earning. So while the man still feels he's responsible and he goes out to bring the bread home, uh, he also knows the woman goes out too and she earns. And so he may not ask for it because he feels responsible uh, to bring the bread home. But in the back of his mind, there is this thing that is nudging uh, that you know, keeps wondering, could she contribute? You know, 
uh, if it is the woman, it's even worse when she's the one bringing uh, the lion's share and the man is not bringing anything home. She begins to wonder, you know, why is this man not taking leadership? Why is he not taking initiative? Why is he not being responsible? I know maybe he has lost his job. I know maybe he uh, is probably in a state where at that more point he's not earning. But when that state is prolonged and he's literally not doing much uh, to bring or he's doing something small and what he gets, he doesn't bring, then that becomes a big, huge frustration uh, to the lady because, uh, you know, God created women uh, to respond. You know, that's why men, a man is, naturally men are supposed to be uh, the one who, the hunter, he's the, the one, the, even in terms of coming into a relationship, he's the one who pursues and the woman responds, you know. Uh, you know, the man is the seed carrier, the woman is the incubator. So the woman receives the seed, then multiplies it and brings it back in good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And that's why I tell men, be careful what you give your woman, because you can be sure it will be multiplied back to you in good measure, you know, shaken together and running over. So if you give her insults, a negative attitude, uh, all those uh, negativity, uh, you know, you will reap the same in the course of time, you know? So, because we have been created as, they have the capacity to incubate. Give a woman 200 shillings and a woman will produce a meal with 200 shillings. Give a man 200 shillings, he doesn't know where to begin, you know? Because women have the capacity to uh, multiply and give it back to you more than you gave it to her, you know? Uh, make something out of nothing, you know? Uh, that's the capacity God has given women. So, because women have been created to respond, when now women are put in a situation where they are the ones who always initiate, it is an unfamiliar territory, an uncomfortable place for a woman to be. And so, my money, our money, is also not a good approach because one person uh, feels uh, used over time and they get to a place where uh, they feel taken advantage of and when they get to that place and that feeling sets in uh, they can arrive at a place we call compassionate fatigue where they no longer care you know and that can be a dangerous place for anyone to get to if somebody feels used and they want to be free from being used then uh, you know it sets off um, you know, a lot of wrong things that can begin to happen in that relationship. And so no one ever wants to feel used and taken advantage of, nobody. And so again, the principle in scripture, you know, that you see even in God's relationship with us is the principle of divine exchange. And life is about give and take. You know, one person cannot just say, I am a receiver, I'm not a giver. So I'm supposed to be the one receiving. I'm entitled to receive, but I never give. You know, look at even the ecosystem. The ecosystem of how things work is that, you know, the plant releases, uh, you know, uh, you know, carbon, uh, is it carbon dioxide, you know, and, and, and we give, uh, we breathe in oxygen, you know, and we give out what the plant needs and the plant gives us you know, what we need. And so you find the ecosystem is such that you have to be giving to receive. There is no one who is meant to be just receiving and never giving. Uh, that's not how God wired life. And even those days when in the traditional setting where the woman never used to go to work, it's because she remained home to take care of the home and uh, so there was something she did. And when she received what she was given, she multiplied it because that's the grace God has given women, you know? And so my money, our money is also not supportive of one, the goal of marriage, which is oneness. The third attitude is what is yours is mine. 
and what is mine is yours. What is yours is mine and what is mine is yours. Now, that attitude implies that when we come into a marriage setting, uh, you know, we are one in every sense, including in our finances. So my money is no longer mine, it is ours. Your money is no longer yours, it's ours. So uh, it's for the family. So I am working uh, so that I can take care of my family. Uh, my wife is working so that she can take care of me. We may not necessarily have a joint account, but I know what is in her account. She knows what is in my account. Uh, I know what he earns. She knows what I earn. You know, uh, now that attitude now helps you to budget together. You know, whether one person is bringing 80%, the other 20 or 60 and the other 40, we pull those resources together and we say we have this much. And then we budget with that money together. We tithe together. We plan together. We invest together. You know, uh, we do things together. We plan for this pool of resource that God has given us together. Now, that attitude promotes the picture of oneness in marriage because there is nothing that I am doing separate from my wife. There is nothing that my wife is doing separate from me. So we are doing it together. Secondly, it promotes openness. There is no secret between us because everything is in the open. Everything is put on the table and then we can be able to plan together. Uh, from that resource, I can give, we can allow each other to have an allowance and say, you know, so much is going to be for your personal use, you know, so that I don't have to, my wife doesn't have to call me to ask me, uh, I need to spend money on the, to, uh, for the salon. But, you know, we know what she needs to spend on and she has an allowance for her personal use. I don't have to tell her that I am taking somebody out for lunch. Uh, you know, when I have met a friend of mine uh, and we want to go together for lunch, maybe this guy wants to see me. I, I don't need to consult my wife to spend money on lunch because I have a personal allowance for this money. But, you know, uh, we plan together our resources so that there are no secrets between us. So if we want to invest, I don't need to invest alone. I invest with her knowledge. If she wants to invest, she doesn't need to invest alone. She invests with my knowledge. You know, she may be the one running with the investment, but it is with my knowledge. You know, I may be the one buying the property, you know, and negotiating for it, but it is with our knowledge. So because everything we have is ours together, we are in this together. Now that promotes openness. It promotes uh, transparency. It discourages uh, secret life uh, or uh, different life from this family and this marriage. We are together. I don't have a different life from what we are talking here as a couple, you know? So that's the attitude we should have in marriage. We shouldn't come into marriage with my money, your money, or my money, our money. We should come into marriage with, you know, what is yours is mine and what is mine is yours. Now, having said that, I need to also say that, uh, having said that, I also need to say that, uh, you know, for that to happen, it must, we must go back to the value system of how, how do I look at money? With what lens do I look at money? Uh, and, and, and when we do that, then it will, I'll need to correct if I'm looking at my perspective of money is wrong. I need to correct that so that I can get into marriage with the right approach. Now, there, the others can be justified. My money, your money can be justified. Uh, and especially in today's world where couples have had to go through divorce a lot and where uh, you have had people taking advantage of each other, you know, it can be justified why I should keep my resources to myself and not allow my spouse uh, you know, into my resources. But 
in the, on the same in the same breath, it will sabotage the kind of relationship that God intended us to have. You know, and and so if we want to have marriage as God intended, we must stop uh, this uh, second guessing one another, and that's why we must come out in the open and you know address this thing uh, the way God wants us to address it. If somebody has a problem with money, we must share and discuss their attitude about money. Now, it's easier when it began right. It becomes more difficult when it began wrong. And so let me first address, you know, the issue of doing it right. The attitude one should have. The attitude we should have of money should be informed by the scripture. The value system we should have of money should be informed by the scripture. What does the scripture then teach about money and about resources? Scripture teaches that God is the owner of all things. He's the possessor. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And all the people that are in it belong to him. So basically the scripture is saying God is the landlord of the earth. God is the owner of all things. Uh, you know, he's the possessor of all things. John chapter 3 and verse 27. John the Baptist says that a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from above, from the father of lights. I mean, from above, sorry. So uh, John is actually saying, anything you have, you have been given from above. You may have worked for it, but it is ultimately God who gave it. So he's pointing out to the fact that whatever God is the owner, whatever we have on this earth, it is because God has trusted us with that resource. God has given it to us. In the book of Corinthians, Paul also says, uh, do, uh, have you received anything? I mean, do you have anything? Why do you boast? Do you have anything? Haven't you received it? In other words, you have no reason to boast because whatever you have, you have received. Uh, James tells us in James chapter 1 uh, and verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. So every good and perfect gift comes from above. So whatever you have, you need to consider that God is the one who gave it to you because God is the owner. That therefore leaves us not as owners, but as stewards. So we are stewards of what God has entrusted us with. Resources, property, money, whatever it is God, we may think we have, we need to look at it from the perspective of stewards. God has entrusted us with those resources for two things for the glory of his name and for the good of our family. That's the reason why God has entrusted us with the resources that he has given us. For the glory of his name, they are his. God has entrusted us so that we can glorify him through the resources. It can serve his agenda and his purposes. Money in the hands of a kingdom person serves God's agenda. Because if you love God, it will serve God's agenda. On the other hand, money in the hand of a kingdom person, we, part of God's agenda, by the way, is the first primary responsibility God gave us, family. We are, we, family is where God has put all his eggs in one basket called family. To build a society, God has uh, instituted marriage and by extension family as the context through which society will evolve. And so God has put all his eggs in this basket. And so God gives, God will never give you a responsibility without resourcing you. And so God allows you to earn, to have, to get what you are getting in order for you to create the environment to raise the godly offspring that God seeks. And so the money you have is for the good of the family and for the glory of his name. 
God is the owner, you are a steward. God is the owner, you are a steward. Number, the other aspect of money, the Bible says, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's first, uh, I think, Timothy chapter six, uh, if I'm not wrong, verse six. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So the question I would want to ask you, which informs your attitude about money, how you answer it, is who determines the content of your life? Who determines what you have? You know, uh, the content of your life. You know, uh, if God is the one who determines the content of your life, then it means that you will be content with what God has given you. And that will help you because you will not fall into the trap of greed. You will not fall into the trap uh, of covetousness. You know, you will not fall in, in, into the things that now lead people into the uh, snare of money. You know, the Bible says, be careful those who, of you who desire to be rich because you will get yourself into, uh, you will pierce yourself with many sorrows. Now, the problem is not being rich. The problem is the love of money, the desire to be rich. If it is overriding in your life, it will cause you to pierce yourself with many sorrows. You see? So that's why the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all evil. We are not supposed to love money. We are supposed to use money. We are supposed to love God and use money. Use money for his glory and for the good of the family, but love God. But when we love money, then we can't love God. Money becomes a God and money dictates what we do. And now what it does is this, money begins to be controlled by your lust and your greed as a person. So you want to tame money, then make money a servant and make God your Lord. Let God be the one to determine the content of your life. You know? Um, so, you know, the, 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 there is a picture where it says, uh, it begins with covetousness. When you covet, become covetous, that means, uh, uh, actually it begins with comparison. Comparison leads to covetousness. Covetousness leads to competition. Competition leads to compromise. Compromise affects your character. That's how we, you know, slide down the slope. Begins with comparison. And that's the danger with many people. You know, I'm comparing myself with my colleagues. I'm comparing myself with my schoolmates, college mates. You know, they have gone ahead of me. They have made it. They are, you know, I visit and they look like they are living well. And so that comparison leads to covetousness. Covetousness leads to competition. Now, so that I want to get ahead of them, I want to uh, look like I'm succeeding more than them. I want to get a better car than uh, them. I want to live in a better house than them. That leads me to compromise. I will cut corners. Uh, I will be uh, available for the highest bidder. I will, uh, you know, I will compromise my values to get money. So then the end justifies the means. So whatever I do uh, to get it, uh, you know, as long as I get it, you know, so the end justifies the means. So I do that and, you know, it completely affects my character and value system. You know, so that's why you have to let God be the one who determines you, the content of your life. You have to be satisfied with what God has given you at every stage of your life. And you can't compare yourself with any other person because that comparison is what kills many a people. And that comparison is also what kills many a marriage. Because I look at myself, I'm married to this guy. And, you know, my friend is married to somebody else and they seem to be doing better than we are doing. 
because you know uh, you know we don't have as much money as they do and i begin to feel like i found myself into the wrong relationship or uh you know um and so because of that you begin to resent your spouse you begin to talk bad to your spouse uh, because they are either not supportive enough or they are not man enough you know uh to provide the way the other person does it and so that begins to eat into your relationship and affect your relationship and what we don't realize is we are destroying our marriage because we want to become like uh, the journeys you know and so we are destroying our own relationship uh, on the account of money so you've got to audit your attitude about money who determines the content of your life we must allow god to move us from one level to the other one of the things i have learned is that god is a progressive god we grow into stuff we don't cut corners to get there we grow into it god is a god of process and so we need to allow god to process us to the next stage to the next level and god will as long as you are with god as long as you are working with god you are bound to make progress that's the nature of our relationship with god i'll give you a case study and 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 you know in scripture uh, which is a very powerful picture you know uh abinadab where the ark of the covenant was stayed with the ark for more than 20 years in his house but you know uh, david comes and gets the ark from abinadab's house abinadab's life didn't change because of the ark N nothing changed in his life because of the ark in fact they became so familiar with the presence of god that when the ark was being carried by david his sons, two sons, Uza and Ahio, uh, because of the familiarity they had developed, uh, familiarity, remember, breeds contempt. Uh, they kind of despised the value of the ark and the protocols that uh, were associated with it. So Ahio walked in front of the ark, Uza walked besides the ark and attempted to help god not fall remember when the ark was going to fall uza's name means strength uh, ahio's name means the brother of yahweh you know so it's like you are age mates with god the brother of yahweh that's the name ahio so, so god strikes uza dead when he attempts to hold the ark you know and uh you know, the, the problem was not because Uza attempted to hold the ark. It didn't begin there. The problem began by their attitude concerning the presence of God. You know, they became too familiar until they threw away the divine protocols associated with how they should carry the ark. They put it on a new cart, Philistine cart. It was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. Ahio walked in front of it it was illegal nobody could lead the ark you know you nobody was supposed to go in front of it you it is an attempt to say you are leading god you know uza tried to uh, you know hold the ark when it was trying to fall a picture of human strength attempting to help god you know and so all those things had already violated the protocols and god struck them dead but then we have Obed Edo, after they died, David decided, I'm not going to continue with this journey. I will leave the ark, go inquire from God what went wrong, and then come back for the ark. So he left the ark at Obed Edom's house. Obed Edom had the ark for only three months before David came back for it. And the Bible says, and Obed Edom prospered because of the ark. To the extent that people could tell that their lives had changed because of the ark being with them. So it tells you something. 
You know, if we have the right attitude about our relationship with God, God is first in our lives. We value God. We have a relationship with him. We are bound to make progress in our lives. But we need to allow God to be the one progressing us. We need not to take matters in our hands and to uh, be impatient to make it and make it big. You know, that's the problem. You know, who determines the content in your life? So coming back, I, I was saying all that to talk about the attitude people come, um, uh, uh, that we should have from scripture about money. Now, as a couple, how then do you handle money? If you are going to survive the pitfalls that have brought many other marriages down, how do you handle money? I think the first place is that attitude we have said, come into the marriage union with a stewardship mindset that I am a steward of what God has given me. Number two, be open and transparent to each other about your financial state. Be open and transparent about each other about money. Practice the culture of openness when it comes to your finances. The, the problem with lack of openness is the day I discovered, uh, I discover something uh, about you when it comes to money. Uh, if, if, if my wife discovers I have some property I have never told her about, what that does is it, you know, brings in uh, trust issues into our relationship. And the question would be, if you could keep that from me, what else are you keeping from me? And from that on, moment on, trust has been damaged, affected, broken. And usually, trust takes so long to build. It takes a moment to break. It takes twice as long to rebuild. So it becomes very difficult to rebuild that trust. So now my wife will begin not just to be uh, suspicious of me on money matters only. She'll begin to be suspicious of me. Does she have another woman somewhere? That, what else is he doing behind my back? And that begins to eat into our relationship. So openness, you know, uh, saves you, prevents you from such issues where the very fundamentals that keep a marriage or a relationship together are broken, you know, like trust. So be open with each other. Number two, cut your coat according to your size. Don't compare yourself with anybody else. Don't compare your relationship with anybody else. When you visit somebody's home and they have a lovely home, they have a lovely fridge, they have a lovely car, you know, celebrate them. Thank God for their success. Go home to yours, which may not be as lovely as theirs, and thank God for what you have. Because tomorrow, God can progress you and you can have uh, what you desire to have. But never compare your life with another. You fall into a trap and a vicious cycle that destroys many marriages. You know, So you begin to push each other. I want to also buy this kind of car. So you get into a debt situation that you can't service and you can't handle. And it eats you up because you want to, you are comparing yourself with somebody else. So avoid the trap of comparison. Cut your coat according to your size. You are not in competition with anybody. Everybody runs their race. You have your race, I have mine. Run your race according to your pace. That's the key. In a marathon, by the way, when people begin a marathon, you normally see there are hundreds of people, you know, thousands at the starting lineup. Thousands of people. And you find a lot of guys who are not trained uh, or understand how this thing works. They are excited and they think the way to win the, uh, the marathon is to you know, like sprint, go fast and go ahead of everybody else, ahead of the pack. What they don't realize, a marathon is a long distance race. It's not about how fast you can run. It is how well you pace yourself. That's the key to winning a marathon. 
how well you pace yourself. It has nothing to do with the other person. It has everything to do with understanding your body, how much it can handle, how much it can take, so that you pace yourself, not to get tired. And you, know, you are able to now run according to your pace. So when you look at the marathoners, those who win, you will notice one common factor. The way they began the race is the way they ran the race all the way to the last probably two or three or at most five kilometers. You know, they, they keep, they maintain the same pace. So they have learned the pace, the, the, the highest pace they can run, they have measured their pace. They know their pace and they run according to their pace. So it has nothing to do with the opponent. You know, so they are not comparing themselves with anybody else. They are just understanding their own pace. And that's the key to winning the race in life. Understand your pace. Don't compare yourself with anybody else. Run your race according to your pace. You know, and, and if others seem to have out sprinted, you don't worry about them. Some of them are going to be casualties along the way because they are going to be choking themselves in debt because they want to get ahead, you know? And you, as you are running according to your pace, you might find you are passing these people along the way who you thought were doing better than you, but they were outpacing themselves. So run your race according to your pace. Don't compare yourself. Some people are getting their money from. Maybe they are dealing drugs. Maybe they are, you know, conning people. Maybe they are doing the wrong thing. They are corrupting their way. And you here, you are depressed because of somebody who is using dubious methods to get ahead. Run your race according to your pace. Cut your coat according to your size. You know, if you can't afford it, you know, don't, don't, don't go for it. If God can't give it to you, don't scheme to get it. You know, let God be the one to give you. Trust God. Pray concerning what you need. Uh, God will give you the ideas. God will give you the opportunities. God will probably give you the strategy or the job. But let God be the one to give you. If God can't give it to you, please don't scheme to get it because you will fall into a trap. Let God provide for you. Don't cut corners to get it. Let God provide for you, you know? So cut your coat according to your size. If you can't afford something now, you know, it doesn't mean you can't afford it tomorrow. You can't afford it now, that's okay. Grow into it, trust God for it. But don't kill yourself for it. Don't stress your spouse for it. You know, let God provide for you. Come together, strategize. The Bible says, if you want to build a house, sit down fast. That means plan, strategize. Sit down fast. Count the cost. You know, uh, see what you have. You know, and, and whether you have enough to finish the house. Now, it doesn't mean when you see you don't have enough, you don't build. No, it means with planning, you can do anything, even when you don't have enough, as long as you strategize. You know, strategy tells you, I may not have it now, but my strategy is the built-in steps until I get there. So Jesus was saying, sit down fast and plan. That's the key. Planning is as spiritual as praying. I repeat, planning is as spiritual as playing. And you can get anything and anywhere with good planning. And when you sit down to plan, God begins to give you divine ideas that can help you. But please don't fall into the trap of cutting corners because you're comparing yourself with another. Run your race according to your pace. That's what has brought a lot of untold suffering to many marriages because of comparison, because of competition, because of covetousness. You know, these things uh, lead into untold problems because of the love of money. So be open. 
and then uh, you know avoid that uh, trap of comparison cut your coat according to your size then the other thing is you know plan together what i said when i talked about purpose uh, for marriage and i said one of it is uh, companionship the other one is partnership and in partnership you work as a team teamwork makes the dream work i have seen couples in my experience who didn't have much but one thing they had going with them was that they were together they were planning together they were doing things together and it's amazing how you see with little they are able to accomplish so much because of their united synergy pulling together but then i've also seen couples who have had you know they are blessed the guy has a good job the lady has a good job but then for some reason you know uh, somewhere you know in kenya we we talk about kona uh, yamwezi you know where uh, the month on the 20th you know because our uh, most employers you know pay people on a monthly basis i know in america it's different um, here it's on a monthly basis so you find by the 20th these guys with all the money they have they are going to borrow because they are pulling in different direction everybody is doing their thing with their money they are not doing things together and so i have seen couples with little achieving so much and i've seen couples with much not being able to achieve a lot uh, simply because one couple is pulling together the other one everybody does their thing so there is power in pulling together the bible gives us this power it says one can chase a thousand two can chase ten thousand notice not two thousand ten thousand that tells you something the principle behind that statement is that when you are one you bring into your relationship a multiplier effect that's the thing you bring into a relationship a multiplier effect not an additional effect but a multiplier effect so when you learn to do things together you bring into your relationship a multiplier effect you know that's the grace that a marriage carries you know when the bible says when god is blessed when brethren dwell together in unity what kind of unity is stronger and better than when a couple works in agreement the bible says when two of you agree as touching anything on earth it shall be done what kind of agreement is more powerful than where a husband and wife work in agreement there is no power in hell that can stop a wife and a husband who are forging together in agreement it brings a multiplier effect it multiplies the results you are able to produce when you walk together as a couple in agreement it's a spiritual principle that unlocks brings a force that the enemy cannot withstand and that's why the enemy fears marriage because he knows the power in the marriage union the spiritual force behind the marriage union the power of agreement and that's why the enemy will do anything to cause a couple never to come to that place of understanding the power behind agreement you know and that's why every principle concerning marriage you know god put order in the marriage union because he never needed the marriage union to walk in disagreement because the moment you walk in disagreement you know you allow the enemy to bite when the hedge is broken the serpent will bite and so you need to learn the power of agreement as a couple doing things together it can't happen when you are not open with each other it can't happen when you are uh, you know not transparent it can't happen when you are busy comparing yourself with others and not content with what god has given you and not allowing yourself to go with god's pace and it can't happen when everybody is doing their thing my money your money everybody is doing their thing in their corner you need to work together teamwork makes the dream work so you need to work 
together, come together, forge together, do things together. Notice why God, how much God values this thing called agreement. He says that as a husband, if I go to pray, it tells me, leave husbands, leave with your wives according to understanding. Other translation says, be considerate about your wife. Otherwise, your prayers will be hindered. So that tells you God is saying, don't come to me to pray when you are not considerate of your wife, when you're not in agreement, in sync with your wife, because I'll not hear you. Now, that's how much God values the issue of agreement in a marriage union, because he knows the power it portends. You know, uh, we must learn to work together in agreement. You know, and, and that means we do things together. If it's investments, we do things together. Some of the things that, you know, uh, bring untold sufferings in a marriage is when I'm doing things on my own, a husband can get into debt and the wife has no idea, you know? And you find that you, you maybe did it with good intentions because you wanted to provide for your family. But then when you fail to service that loan, the people who end up suffering most are the very people you are trying to do this for. And what makes it even more painful and hurt, hurtful is that your spouse had no idea. And so you find when auctioneers come to your house, they are taking things that are your family things, yet the person that entered into debt is one party who never informed the other. If you be together, then there will be no fixing blame, you know, because we were in this together. We were, we were aware. And sometimes you help each other, you see blind spots. Everybody has blind spots. So I may say, I want to take a loan. And my wife says, it doesn't feel right. We shouldn't do it, you know? And, you know, that helps me because you know, she may see what I'm not seeing. I may see what she's not seeing. And so that's the power of us coming together. So that if we are taking the risk, we take it together. We calculate the risk. And that leads me to the next point. As a couple, avoid debt, unnecessary debt, as much as you can. If you have to get into debt, then get into debt that is uh, calculated, that brings in income, not debt that is consumer debt. You know, avoid consumer debt. Because that is, uh, you know, a, a hole you're digging. Uh, you, are not, you are not helping yourself. You are not helping your marriage, you know. Uh, again, I, I use the same phrase I used earlier. If God can't give it to you, then you're not ready for it at that point. Trust God for it. Don't borrow for consumer goods. I mean, that's a principle that every couple should apply. Don't borrow for consumer goods. Borrow for investment. And it is a calculated debt that you know, uh, you've thought through, you've planned through, you know, but don't borrow for consumer goods. Don't get into unnecessary debt. Avoid debt as much as you can. You know, save. Uh, build your capital base uh, as much as you can. And only get into debt when it is, there is no other way for that investment. And because you are getting into something that will bring in more. Don't get into debt to buy stuff that is consumer goods that are not bringing in, you know, more. I know that's a tough one, but that's an important principle. Because I've seen couples who are happy together, but then debt brought tension in the house. When there is no money, tension comes in. And if you have not built openness, transparency, uh, solid friendship uh, as a couple, uh, togetherness, then that tension will destroy that marriage. You know, because there are ups and downs in life. And they are even with all the principles done right. There are lean moments in life, just as much there 
as there are plen moments of plenty. What will help you and govern uh, your relationship during the lean moments and help you through during those lean moments and during the tough moments or the good times in your marriage is the principles you have uh, centered your life around, which should not be the love of money. The principles you've centered around your life is that you are, you know, governed by God and his word. You are stewards. That will help you. When money comes, it doesn't get to your head. I've seen people, when they get a little more money, they marry another wife. They go for mistresses and women. Uh, when they get money, a women, you know, when they get more money than the man, they begin to look down on the man because they're earning more than the man. You know, that's wrong. You are not the, your husband is not the head of the house because he earns more. No, he is not the head because he's more educated. He is not the head because he's better than you. He is the head because it's a leadership assignment God has given him. And so if you earn more than him, don't wrestle power from him. Let him lead because that's divine order. The moment we break divine order, we bring trouble into our relationship. You may be more educated than him. Let him lead because that's the divine order is that God assigned man the role to lead his family. You know? Uh, so he's not the leader of the family because of his is the leader of the family because God assigned him to lead. So allow your man to lead. That's, that's what I would emphasize. Allow your man to lead no matter how successful you are. And men, men on the other hand, get intimidated and shouldn't be with the success of their wives. So if your wife earns more, don't be intimidated by her success. Celebrate her. Because remember, the principle is what she has is yours, what you have is hers. So it should be your joy that she is doing well. Because everybody has their grace. So celebrate them. Don't be intimidated by them. You know, uh, celebrate their success. In fact, empower them uh, to be even more successful. Because your leadership is not based with on how much you bring. No, it's an assignment God has given you. You know, on the other hand, now, when it comes to uh, the man, it's foolish for the man, when you get money, the person who has stood with you, stood by you, worked with you, you know, uh, when you had nothing, and now you have, to abandon that person, 80%, maybe because of 20% of the things you consider not very uh, attractive to you, uh, to go for 20% out there and you are abandoning 80% uh, of great value that God has given you. That is foolish. So as a man, you know, uh, the fact that you have more money is not reason for you to go to for another person and abandon your family in the process that's what happens uh, you begin to uh, be enticed because some women out there will come into your life because of what you can do for them and you think that they are giving you what you're not getting from your spouse but really they are fooling you because they are after what you've got you know, uh, and it is foolish to abandon the person who's been with you and stood with you all this way, uh, you know, and, and allow somebody else who's not fought battles with you to now begin to enjoy what your family should be enjoying, you know. So I think it's sinful on one hand, on the other hand, it's foolish for us to do some of those things. So may God help us, uh, you know, undergird our financial attitudes, 
value system with the word of God. That's the key to escape the danger that is ever present for every couple when it comes to the question of finances. I will stop there for now and allow any questions um, if we have. So if we have any question, please, you can text uh, on the chat section and let me know. Um, then we can get ready to wrap it up. Right. Feel free because in the course of talking, I learned something. Jesus responded, I mean, gave some of the most powerful truths prompted by questions. That's the power of questions. Questions help us, uh, you know, questions are like having a bucket, throwing it in the well. It causes you to draw from the well, you know, when you have questions. Um, then question Nicodemus asked Christ, gave us the key to salvation, you know? Uh, so questions are like buckets thrown down deep into the well. You are able to draw water from that well. Uh, so that's why it's good to ask questions. You are teaching. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to uh, share with these wonderful people, uh, even in the attempt of us living up marriage, uh, you know, based on your template and design. I pray, oh God, that the truths we have learned will go a long way in helping uh, many a marriage, uh, everyone under the sound of my voice, that God, we will be helped uh, as a result. I pray where there are challenges, in finances, in a marriage relationship. I pray for wisdom to be able to uh, navigate through those challenges. I pray that you will bring uh, a couple that is dealing with this kind of struggle to come to the table, share, be open with one another and be able to forge ahead together for the glory of your name. So may you bless your people. May you come through for your people. May you help your people to process and make the right decisions when it comes to their finances. May money not be a reason for anybody under the sound of my voice uh, to, uh, you know, uh, have their marriage break down in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, oh God, that you will also bless your people, provide for your family, uh, the families represented here, oh God. And I pray, oh God, may you come through that as your people forge together, work hard, plan together, you will come through for them, oh God, and provide for their everyday need. We give you honor and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Back to Dorcas. Hello, back to Dorcas. You're still muted. Ah, okay. Ah, thank you so much. We appreciate Reverend um, Albert. God bless you so much. Um, for your wisdom, we thank God for you and we bless you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we told to love God, to love God and use money. That was interesting. Use money, love God. That God should be our our Lord and money our servant. We should not serve money. Thank you so much. We really appreciate and. Uh, Mm, tomorrow we're coming very early so that we can finish. We thank God for uh, everyone who came. May God bless you. May God make you the hearer and uh, the doer of the word and not just the hearer. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We bless you. Um, and tomorrow we pray that everyone will be early because tomorrow is the last time. So, um, 
see you tomorrow. Thanks so much, Angolo Mtuma, Baraba Opoku. Thank you so much, Catherine Muya. Thank you, Donna, Emma, we appreciate you. Fael Olo, Fiona, Grace Brown, Rona, no, Rona Naomi, Nisha, Pastor Rachel, Priscilla, uh, Reverend Albert Chitako, uh, Argumbas, Shai, Susan, and Trya, we love you all and we thank you so much for coming. And tomorrow is our last day and we hope it will be, it will be as powerful as today. Let's continue praying for one another, for our marriages, and it shall be well with us in Jesus' name. Thank you and good night, everybody. God loves you. Amen. <laughs>